store all these 66 books there's so much that God has hidden even in a few verses it's a beautiful thing it shows the transcendency of God to inspire his word in such a way that it's unique in such a way that it's it's precious in such a way that it is it is magnificent that when we open the word of God we don't just see words that has been spoken by men we see words coming directly from the throne of God words that he has himself spoken he has himself inspired to inspire means that no matter what the vessel is doing the inspiration is coming from God the words that are being pinned down the thought process that is being guided to write this is coming from above from somebody that understands more than we understand from somebody that sees much more deeper than we ourselves see and so it has been a blessing and today I'd like to read again from verse 1 because I'd like to to concentrate in a certain part that is uh, verse 16 verse 16 of the first chapter of the book of John verse 16 up to 18 uh, but for us to have context again we are going to read it from verse 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God all things were made through him and without him was made was uh, and without him nothing was made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it there was a man sent from God whose name was John that is John the Baptist not the one writing this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that excuse me that all through him might believe he was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world he was in the world the light and the world was made through him and the world did not know him he came to his own and his own did not receive him but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of god to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh not of the will of the man of, of man but of god 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth john bore witness of him and cried out saying this was he of whom i said he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace for the law was given through moses but grace and truth came through jesus christ no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So, one thing that you can you can be able to see in this is that every single every single verse, in one way or another, always points us to the deity of Christ, to the to the identity of Christ. And the reason why that is just mind-boggling is because. When you see the last part of this book, the book of uh, uh, chapter 20, verse 31, he said that these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and by believing, you might have life in Him. And so, when this book is being written, it's written for a purpose, and the purpose is that we may uh, be able to know, we may be able to believe that Jesus is the person that he claimed to be. Jesus is the person that he claimed to be. Um, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So life in his name comes after believing. After believing what? After believing that he is the Christ. Christ, what does that mean? The Son of the living God. And so the identity of Christ and the deity of Christ is so important in that without you believing it or without you comprehending what that 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 is who that that is who he is having life in him is nearly impossible and by nearly impossible i mean impossible because if you don't know in whom you have believed then what is going to anchor your belief 
how are you going to stay in that place? Yeah. So, belief in the identity of Christ, the true identity of Christ, he is part of the triune God, God, the Son, there's God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and these three are one in nature and in essence. Without you believing that, then how are you going to have life in him? Because if he's not who he claims to be, then he's a man. If he's a man, then salvation cannot be in any man except God himself. So that is very important. But I'd like us to draw our attention to verse 16 and verse 17. He says, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. So what have we received in God? What is the fullness of God that we have received? The fullness of God that we have received is grace upon grace. The Bible says that where sin abounded, grace abounded even more. In other words, when our weakness showed itself, when our human nature took control in sin, God showed himself even more godly. By more godly, I mean even more holy. The holiness of God, that is what gave us grace and merited favor. When our weakness, when our spiritual man, when the sinful nature of our spiritual man uh, lets us down, God shows himself God. That the grace of God becomes even much more predominant. You repent, put your faith and belief in Christ, and you get baptized so that you start walking that walk. Everything else that you do after that, the grace of God abounds even more. And so if God is taking you through a process of sanctification because of your sin, then the grace of God abounds even more. Why does the grace of God abound even more? The grace of God abounds even more so that you can be able to get out of that thing and give glory to God and God alone. Because if, if we get born again and then we have the ability to, on our own self, we have the ability on our own self to conquer sin, for example, then the glory will be on us. They will say, maybe the grace of God abounded at first, but not at the latter. But at the latter is what is most important because there's something called guilt. Guilt comes when you do something that you're not supposed to do and you have the conscious. Your conscious has been rejuvenated, revived. Your conscious has been brought back to life so that things like small things start to bother you. Sin starts to bother you. Sin becomes exceedingly sinful. When sin becomes exceedingly sinful, then our conscious also starts to, to haunt us when you do sin. That is why the grace of God abounds even more. The grace of God abounds even more, let me repeat. The grace of God abounds even more when sin becomes exceedingly sinful in our lives. And so the Bible says that of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. So we have, all, we have not only received his fullness in the, in the sense of uh, him coming to die for us and we receive the fullness of the Godhead, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. I'm not just talking about that fullness alone, but the fullness that came with him, that is grace, unmerited favor, the grace that is accounted on our behalf, that he gives but is accounted on our behalf. So when Jesus Christ came on the earth, walked as a man, we saw the fullness of the Godhead that dwelt in him because he could be able to do things that only the Godhead could do. He could be able to forgive sins, heal diseases, cast out demons, um, he was able to walk on water, he was able to design the hearts of men, things that only God can do. So we saw the fullness of the Godhead in him, in other words, the proof that this is the Son of God, the Son of God not as just a title, but his own identity, that he is one with God, the Father. But you also receive the fullness of the gift of that Godhead. So the fullness of the Godhead came with the gift which was full in itself, that is grace. And so grace upon grace. Amen? I don't know if you are understanding this up to that point. If you are not, then you can just lift up your hands at the chat box <laughs> so that you can explain this even much more clearly. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us. And so he says, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. 17 says, For the law was given through Moses. And then he repeats again, But grace and truth 
came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. It does not mean that the law did not come with truth. Of course it came with truth because the Bible says that the law is here as a schoolmaster for, for us to know what sin is as a tutor. For us to know what sin is so that we can stay away from that sin, of course. And that in itself is truth. And so, but it says, the law was given through Moses. I'd like us to take a look at a few verses so that we can understand what this is all about. This law that was given through Moses. If you turn with me in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 4. In fact, we can even read from verse, verse 1. It says, and this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Two, and he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined, he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand, went a very low, a very low for them, a very low for them. So when he showed up in his light, in his glory from Mount Paran and he came with 10,000 of his saints from his right hand went a fairy law for them so a fairy law for them right so that is the law that came it came directly from God the law that came directly from from God from this from 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 the shining glory of God so the law came directly from God that three says yeah he loved the people all his saints are in thy hand and they sat down at thy feet everyone shall receive for thy, uh, of thy words. So, four says, Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Israel. Okay, so he's talking about the law that was given unto them by Moses himself, of course. We see what the law was all about in uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 3, the book of Exodus, chapter 19, 5 to 6. So, God is talking to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. In fact, we can even start from verse 1. It says, so I'm, I'm giving a context of what the law is all about and why God gave the law and uh, how the children of Israel were supposed to receive the law and the context through which the law was given. So as we, as we say, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We want to see from what context was the law given. So was it, did it, it did not just come from... It did not just come from Moses himself as a man. He did not sit down somewhere and, and, and come up with the law. There was something much more... Uh, there was something in the background. And that's why we know that it is God through this man of God, Moses himself. God, God himself gave them the law. You can just read in the book of Deuteronomy. God himself in his, in his brightness, he showed up and he gave them the law. So it says... Uh, Exodus chapter 19, one says, In that month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai, for they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness. So God is giving instructions, direct instructions to Moses, so that he can communicate that to the children of Israel. He says, verse 4, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. So before he starts telling them exactly what they're supposed to do, in other words, before he gives the law, he establishes his identity again. He says, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. Now, that is a very interesting thing to say. So he did not say, Behold, look, I did these mighty things. I did, I did, I did, I did this and this and this and this for you, for your favor. I provided this, I provided that. I was your provider. So here is the law that you're supposed to keep. No, he says, you have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. So what did he do unto the Egyptians? He did not provide food. And uh, the Israelis were marveled by it. No, what he's talking about, he's talking about number one, the ten plagues. And so he says, you have seen, you have seen, so, and that is why when the children of Israel are getting out of Egypt, he's telling them, for them to remember the day that they were brought out of the land of Egypt and to teach their children. So it's a continuous thing. They're supposed to be remembering the judgment of God 
or on the people of Egypt so that they can be able to escape that land of captivity. And so freedom did not come to them for free. It costed some people judgment. God had to step into the picture and render judgment to the people of Egypt so that they can be able to let his people go. To do what? So that they can worship him in the wilderness. So when God is giving them a background story before the law, before, uh, the law is given at this, at this instant, what happens is God reminds them of what he did to the Egyptians. You have the evidence of what I did. You have the evidence of the judgment that I rendered unto the Egyptians. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings. In other words, I carried you, I carried you comfortably, traversing all these other, all all these all these things that are happening in between. I carried you on eagle's wings. I carried you in the wings of safety. I carried you safely. No matter, you know, no matter the situations of the wind that were be that were maybe beating you, you know, when I was flying you out, I still carried you. I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself unto myself so I brought you unto myself so where was God was God in Egypt of course he was in Egypt but where did he want them to go out to worship out in the wilderness so God might be everywhere of course but there's a place where he wants you specifically so he says how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself so he's talking about the manner through which he brought them. It's not that God was an eagle, so he was flying around with the children of Israel. That would have been a very mighty big eagle to be over you know, millions of people. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, but he's, he's talking about the manner through which you know, he brought them out safely. He says, I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. 5 says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now, that takes a very beautiful turn, and I'll tell you why it takes a very beautiful turn, because our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, who died, on, who died for us on our behalf, gives us these promises. You see the promises that I just read, verse 5. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar people unto me above all, the, above all people, for all the earth is mine. He's saying, listen, for you to be my peculiar people, I know I have a covenant with your father, Abraham, that you will be my people, but now I'm bringing you unto my mountain, I'm bringing you out of Egypt, because I want to make, I want to renew that covenant with you guys. Now you guys, because he says, verse 4 says, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. So he's giving them a background for them to trust him, for them to be able to, com uh, um, for them to be able to commit to a covenant between now Israel themselves, the people of Israel, and God, not just Abraham, the person, and God, because it might be easier for one individual to to commit to God. It's even much more harder for a whole house to commit unto God, and that is why I would say, as for me and my house. And that is said way after. So I believe at this context, uh, Joshua has a revelation here. So he's not just saying, as for me, like Abraham, me, I will serve you. I'll have a covenant with you, Lord. He's saying, Joshua says, as for me and my house. So in this context, you can actually say, you, you, you can actually see the picture of, Ab it's like Abraham and the whole house of Israel. Because now, you know, the children that God promised him are, are already here. So God is coming on a personal level to the children of Israel. And he's saying, he says to them, and he shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. That is verse 6. Let me start from 5. Now, therefore, if he shall obey my voice, indeed. Now, this is instruction God is giving to Moses and to the children of Israel. Because you remember, you know, when they came to the to the mountain and the the mountain quaked, <laughs> you know, these guys were like, I don't think this is a good idea. This guy showing up like this, man. I don't. I, I we do not sign up for this. <laughs> we do not sign up for this. Moses, you go. Whatever it is that he'll say, we'll do it. 
Okay? He says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, so you will obey my voice, what I will speak, that which I will say, you will obey my voice. And the voice is usually uh, coming through a servant, of course, right? like Moses in this, in this manner. So he's saying, if you will obey my voice, so if when Moses shows up with these commandments, you will obey. Okay? So that is one prerequisite. And then he says, and keep my covenant. So you will obey the voice, and you will keep the covenant, then you shall be. So there's a prerequisite to be. You, do, you don't just be because you showed up. Uh, whatever it is that they are going through right now is that they've been validated as the people of God in itself. But something else is going on here that is even much more intimate than them just being proclaimed children of God because of their root, because of their ancestry through, through Abraham. So it's like God is asking for a personal relationship here because, listen, the covenant had already been made with Abraham. It says, your seed, I will multiply your seeds, that his seed will be God's chosen people through Isaac. But God here is getting even much, much more personal. So whatever it is that he told Abraham, now he's telling to the children of Israel themselves so that they can be able to make a commitment. And he says, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Why do I have the authority uh, for me to say that you shall be my people is because all the earth is mine. He said to say everything, everything belongs to me. So if you keep my covenant, so for you to be a peculiar treasure, there are rules to be followed. There's something that needs to be done. And that is why John chapter 14 verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our board with him. I mean, that is very interesting because Jesus is tying the father to this promise. Almost sounds like the same same thing we just read in the book of, of Exodus, right? Unless I don't know what I'm talking about. In which case, I think we're in trouble right here. Did you see that? But it was just me. Can I read it again? Let me read it again. And Jesus said, uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. Wait, what? If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him. It's like for a, it's like, uh, for a second there, Jesus this disconnected himself with that promise and gave preeminence to the father and then he brought himself second he says and we will come unto him and make our board with him if god decides to come and make an abode with you then that means you're a very precious person in fact you're a very precious thing let me not even say a person you are a precious gem because the Bible says that God does not dwell in temples made by human hands. Unless I, you know, they updated the Bible, then we are all in trouble. For God to come and dwell in the human heart, then that place needs to be special. Those people are a special people. They are a peculiar treasure. And so, it's almost the same same tone I'm hearing in the book of Exodus chapter 19 verse 5 says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So Israel has been given a promise here that Jesus Christ is giving us later on, but even in full measure, grace upon grace, of course, and I will explain to you how that is, is seen. Because in the book of Exodus, when he gives them the promise of what makes them a peculiar people, there's something that comes before that. That means keeping the covenant and obeying the voice. So the voice of Christ comes in the book of John chapter 1. That is the voice of God himself comes, walks on the earth. And that voice says, if you love me, okay, if you love me, then you will keep my, you keep my words. And my father, <laughs> and my father, 
So the promise, and that is why when uh, Jesus says that he has not come to abolish the law or to get rid of the law. In the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. That he has not come. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So the, the fulfillment of the law, part of that law is, are we together so far? Part of that law is, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be peculiar treasure. So Jesus comes and fulfills that. I'll show you how he comes and fulfills that. The book of Isaiah chapter 60 verse 14. Let's go there. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 14. When God says that the law came through Moses, but grace came through Jesus Christ, we may be able to understand what he's talking about and why that is very important for us. Because God never speaks and it's not important. God never speaks and you go like, maybe that's not as important as we think it is. Any single word that comes that proceeded from the mouth of God uh, is equally important because the Bible says that you do not go back to Him void. So it is important for us to understand every single word God speaks. And this is part of the words that God speaks that grace came through Jesus Christ as the law came through Moses. Amen. Grace came through Jesus Christ. So there's a promise that God is giving to the children of Israel here which is part of the prophets, the law and the prophets. It says, The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despised uh, thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of their feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. So he's trying to tell them that you are abode, O Israel, that is Zion, uh, the city of the Lord. In other words, the place where God dwells, and you know where God dwells is a precious place, so it's not just because God chooses to dwell somewhere, he just dwells there. It's because he has established people that are there are precious to him. And so how, how are they precious? We saw in the book of Exodus. So what is precious before God uh, should also be precious to us. And that is why we are, we are reading this, these verses. Now, I'd, I'd like to give you a few, a few scriptures. You, you might read them later on that talks about, that talks about um, the fulfillment of this of this word specifically that people coming to bow before uh, God's chosen people in this instance this is not just Israel itself but us because we've been grafted into the Israel of the Lord we've been grafted into the promise you know of Israel why because Israel when they were given an opportunity for them to leave the commandments that God gave them like we saw in the book of Exodus that for them to be a people to be a peculiar people that God should dwell in their midst there was a prerequisite for that to happen there was given them a commandment for them to keep so that when they keep those words, when they keep those ways, then God can be able to say, these are my people, these are peculiar people, these are people that I've chosen. So that when the book of Isaiah comes and says that these people, the people that offended you, the people that laughed at you, the people that uh, despised thee, shall come and bow down at, unto, unto the soles of thy feet. For this to be fulfilled, it has to be fulfilled to the people of God. In which case we saw that was Israel, right? Now, when Christ comes, he says, the law came through Moses. So the law that established Israel as a chosen people came through Moses. But grace, grace came through Jesus Christ. Now, for us, that have been, for us that have received the grace of God, the Bible says that for them that received him, he gave them the right to become the children of God. So now, we've been grafted into the Israel of God. In other words, we are God's chosen people. So that means every single promise that entails the children of God, that is the Israel of God, the beloved of God, all those promises amount unto us. So the first one is, are we a peculiar people, a chosen people, a loved people, a treasured people? You can see the mightiness of who God is on how he rescued his people, Israel. Now, can you imagine that that same, same way is how the fullness of grace that came through Jesus Christ, in whom the Godhead dwelt, us who have become the sons of God, the children of God through adoption, he does that to us also. So when he says, grace upon grace, this time it's even much more powerful because God in human flesh comes and fulfills all the law and anybody that obeys his words 
anybody that obeys his word is grafted into the Israel of God. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people. So number one, you are a chosen generation. Number two, you are a royal priesthood. The priesthood only happened in Israel, no other place. So what is he trying to say? Okay, you can draw your conclusion. An holy nation. So God is not only making a covenant with you as an individual, but as a nation. Okay, a peculiar people. And that is why the Bible says that don't think that, you know, the temptation that you maybe you're fighting or that you're going through is, is strange to you. Like it's, it's, it's only happening to me. There's so many brothers and sisters out there because you are a nation. You are, you, you are a community of people. You are a community of so many believers out there in the world because God has remnants everywhere. A peculiar people. Peculiar means strange. Weird. <laughs> people that cannot be understood. People. And why are you not understood? Because the light shineth in darkness and darkness comprehended it not. The light shineth in darkness. You know what light? The light that you're brought into when you, he called you out of darkness. So that light makes you a peculiar person. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you. Why is he doing this? So that you may show forth the praises of him who called you. Why did he bring them out of Egypt? So that they can go and worship him. In fact, the complete uh, uh, marriage between the promises that were given to Israel, the Israel of God, the chosen people, and us as Christians, that we are not lesser. In fact, right now, we are in a much better place than Israel itself as a physical nation. Because for us, we did not reject. When we are presented by the gospel, we accepted Christ. We accepted God himself. We accepted to walk according to his ways. So between, between the covenant that was made by law and the covenant that has been made by grace, which is much more better, out of the 613 laws that were given to, to Israel, out of 613 laws that were given to Israel, number one, almost, if I'm not wrong, almost half of it they can't keep right now because there's no temple. Or at least almost half cannot be kept. So how are they going to be a chosen people right now <laughs> if they can't even keep the law? That is why the Bible says, but grace came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. That he went, so it's like, if, if Israel was wise enough, they could have accepted their Messiah. And their Messiah could have paid the penalty for their sins, that they don't need to burden themselves that they cannot keep the law right now because the temple is not there. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see the freedom that comes through Christ Jesus? So the temple was destroyed after Christ. Now they cannot keep uh, the laws of the temple. Because the law was divided into two. The Pharisees come to Jesus and ask him, out of all this law, which is more important? And he says, what is the, he asked him, uh, that is Matthew 22, 36. 22, 36 says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? These are the children of Israel asking. The Pharisees <laughs> and the Sadducees, you know, the ones who are masters in the law. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. See that right there? He summarized the commandment into that first one. And then says that hey, this is the first and the great commandment. God, putting God first. Just like God says, if you obey my voice. Amen. And if you will keep my commandments. If you will keep my statutes. So love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see, love me as your God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And then love these people that I've created in my, in my image as you love yourself. On these commandments hang all the law and the prophets. These two commandments hangs all the commandments, the 613 commandments that God gave to Israel, and the prophets. And the things that the prophets came and spoke about. All these two. Now, when, God, when Jesus comes, walks on the earth, and fulfills, because he, say, he says, I have not come that I should destroy the law, but to fulfill. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophet, or the prophets, so he puts them on here, that is Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So when Jesus is summarizing the law into two great laws, 
That means for him to be able to be perfect, he has to keep this true. Now, how does he keep this? If you read the book of John chapter 17, it outlines this perfectly because it starts with God. It says, Lord, we won't really get into that. You can read that later on. But from John chapter 17, you can see the love of, the love of Jesus Christ, the Son, towards the Father. That he loved him with, the, with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind. To the point where he said, not my will, but thy will. That he was obedient to the point of death through the cross. Now, that is love. With all the heart. Not that if your heart decides to tell you something else, you're always there. If your soul or if your mind tells you something else, if your feeling starts talking, then you will leave God and start going towards your feeling. So, Jesus fulfilled the first one. The second one is still in the book of John chapter 17. He says, he loved these people to the end. <laughs> he loved these disciples. Now, that is men, of course. He loved them that he died for them. When Peter denied him, what did Jesus do? He came back and restored him. There's no greater love than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. These were Jesus' friends. That he says, I've not, called you, I've not called you servants, I've not called you slaves, but you're like my brothers. You're in my father's house because you've kept my commandments. So he loved them, he loved the neighbor, as himself so he loved them as the same way he loved God <laughs> that he died for them